I think most people, when they think about a bilingual child or an English language learner, they tend to think about a model where a child speaks one language at home and then comes to school and learns English. So learns one and then adds another, or in other words, is a sequential bilingual. But in fact, we know that the majority of English language learners in the United States are actually simultaneous bilinguals, meaning that they're learning uh, um, one language or more in the home as well as English. And so when they start school, it's not that they have a strong foundation in a home language, but they're really developing both at the same time. And we just don't know enough about what that process of becoming bilingual looks like. My colleague Kathy Escamilla is doing some wonderful work in this area with a program called Literacy Squared where she's actually teaching children to read in English and Spanish at the same time, building on this idea that children do have a background in both languages and we need to help children draw from access their full linguistic repertoire, their strengths in both, and not say, okay, now it's only English time, now it's only Spanish or, or whatever. Um, another important aspect of this is that the testing we have done on children tends to give us a limited picture of their language proficiency when we use this um, sequential bilingual lens. Jeff McSwan has written a lot about this, where we end up with children when tested in their native language in English, have a limited score on both, and we say they're non-nons, though they don't have a language. And in fact, if you look at their full proficiency, you see how much they really know. One example of this would be if you give a kindergarten child the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test in English and he does um, okay but below average in English and you give him that same test but in Spanish where the words are you know, a little different he does below average in Spanish as well, and you say, oh, you know, look, he's below average in both, you know, um, limited. And yet, if you look at the total number of words that child knows when you combine English and Spanish, it's actually greater than what his or her peer could, uh, might know. And so it's just a whole other way to think about this process of becoming bilingual. And we just don't know enough about it. So I think that really is important for how we think about RTI and, and calling kids at risk in kindergarten. Something that I like to say is if we think about our goal in education is preparing children for the global economy and what an asset it is to be bilingual and multicultural, then those children starting out in kindergarten knowing more than one language actually have a head start. And we just need to do a better job supporting their learning in, in both languages. And again, I think RTI really can help us do that. But we have to change the way we think about children and the strengths they, they bring to school. I think there's a lot of confusion about what it means for instruction to be culturally and linguistically responsive. I think certainly we can think about the curriculum and maybe the books children are reading. I like to think of um, the analogy of children needing windows and mirrors. So windows um, you know, to see out into the world and, and others' experiences, but mirrors to see their own experiences reflected in what they're reading. And I think that is really important. But I think it goes much beyond that as well. And it has to do with valuing the strengths the children bring to school and understanding that children are socialized to learn in different ways. And one example of this would be um, a dissertation one of my doctoral students did a few years ago, Jenny Erbach, where she did an oral storytelling intervention in a first grade classroom where all the students were African American and she had someone from the community come in and do oral storytelling with the students and then the children themselves also told stories and it was a, a wonderful activity but what was so important and relevant I think about it was that then she analyzed the children's stories and she used a traditional format a rubric for 
analyzing the components of children's stories and found that they looked sort of limited, you know, um, you know, in terms of following a set sequence having, you know, beginning, middle, and end, and they didn't appear to be very strong. But when she brought in other ways of looking at the story, she found that they were actually really richly complex and that the children were very good at things like engaging the audience and um, that they would use a more circular style where they would introduce a topic and then you know veer away from it but come back and go away and come back you know in a way that was very engaging for the audience so she was able to show that these children really actually had some wonderful strengths that if you only used the one sort of traditional way of evaluating them, they would look very limited. So I think that's just one example, but it shows how being culturally responsive means understanding that there are multiple ways of looking at you know, what a child is doing and understanding his or her strengths so that we can build on those. You know, doesn't mean we don't teach the child that more traditional form of storytelling. Of course we do, but we do it by valuing what they bring to the classroom and then you know, helping the child feel good about that and then teaching them more.